Helen read earlier from the prophet Isaiah. Sometimes Isaiah is divided up into three sections, and biblical scholars talk about actually three different individuals, first Isaiah, second Isaiah, third Isaiah, who, who composed and wrote the book across a, a number of years. The first part of Isaiah, 1 through 39, was written perhaps in the 700s BCE, before Common Era, 8th century BCE. Then Second Isaiah, which begins with chapter 40, which Helen read, uh, be, is probably written sometime in the mid-500s BCE. Then when Mark begins his gospel, he begins by hearing the echo of the words from Second Isaiah, which Helen read uh, just earlier in, in this beginning of the story of Jesus, as, as Mark puts it together, he doesn't go to Bethlehem, but he goes to another familiar place to the people of Israel. He goes to the wilderness and hears the voice of one uh, which he remembered Isaiah talking about as well. I'm reading from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the movie Shawshank Redemption, Morgan Freeman plays the character Red, who has been in prison since committing a terrible crime as a young boy. Now, Red has come up for his parole hearing numerous times throughout his prison sentence. And at one point in the movie, you see a collage of Red's appearances before the parole board. The first time, he's a young man, and when he comes in, he stands before the parole board, and he's nervous and fidgety, and his answers to the board's question sound like he's memorized the script. It sounds like somebody's told him what they're going to ask you, and here's what you should say. The board says to him, we see you've served 20 years of a life sentence. Do you feel you are rehabilitated? And Red's answer is, oh, yes, sir, absolutely, sir. I mean, I've learned my lesson. I can honestly say I'm a changed man. I'm no longer a danger to society. That's the God's honest truth. And then the board looks down at their papers, and they give this response you see the response as a big red stamp come down, comes down on the parole papers and says, rejected, in big red letters, rejected. And then another parole hearing 10 years later. We see you've served 30 years of a life sentence. Do you feel that you are rehabilitated? And this time, Red, who is 10 years older, and you can see that, gives the same answer, but with a little more confidence and introspection. Oh, yes, sir, without a doubt, I'm a changed man. No danger to society here. Absolutely rehabilitated. And then the board's response in big red letters of the stamp, rejected. 
And then 10 years later, he comes before the board again. We see you have served 40 years of a life sentence. Do you feel you have been rehabilitated? And this time you can see how much Red has aged, all the gray in his hair, the wrinkles in his face. And you can see that he's weary and skeptical of this parole board exercise. And he takes a deep breath and he says, rehabilitated? Well, now let me see. You know, I don't have any idea what that really means. The parole board chair says, well, it means you're ready to go back into society. And Red quickly interrupts him and cuts him off and says, oh, I know what you think it means. But to me, it's just a made-up word, a politician's word, so that young fellows like yourself can wear a suit and tie and have a job. What do you really want to know? Am I sorry for what I did? There's not a day that goes by that I don't feel regret, not because I'm in here because you think I should. I look back on who I was then, a young stupid commit who committed that terrible crime, and I want to talk to him. I want to try and talk some sense into him, tell him the way things are, but I can't. That kid's long gone. All that's left is this old man and I've got to live with that. And then you see the stamp come down on the parole papers again. But this time it says in big red letters, approved. And in the next scene, Red has a new suit on and he's carrying a suitcase. And he's walking out of prison into freedom and a new life. And all the complications that's going to mean for him. In the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah, the prophet announces the judgment of God on the faithlessness of the people of Israel, and he announces the consequences of their sin. That judgment concludes with the prophecy that the nation of Babylon will invade and destroy Jerusalem, and the people of Israel will be scattered and taken captive. And like a big red stamp on the papers of a parole board, it comes down again and again and again through those first 39 chapters, rejected, rejected, rejected. And so it happens. Israel's kingdom comes crashing down as a result of God's judgment. It may have been as long as 150 years between the destruction of Jerusalem and the, the end of the exile which Israel had been taken into in Babylon. And that time of exile is a time of suffering and sorrow, 160 years across which memory starts to fade and faith wanes and doubts grow. And so perhaps the people had begun to question, across all those years, how could God let this happen? Could our God be weak? Could God's promises be illusory? Why should we continue to believe the words of the prophets and the priests? What are their words compared to the strength and the destructive forces of Babylon's armies? It's just going to be the same again and again, rejected, rejected, rejected. And throughout the, the whole period of exile, perhaps the people prayed without getting the answers that they hoped for, without perhaps getting any answers, and they lost hope of returning home. And it, and it and they began to take on the culture and the beliefs of their surroundings, forgetting who they, who they are and who they were. Like long-term prisoners, they grew accustomed to hearing the parole board, to hearing the prophets say over and over again, rejected, rejected, rejected. Maybe, maybe across those years, the silence of God produced a people who said cynically, like Red said to the parole board, do I have faith? Do I have hope? I'm not sure what those words mean anymore. I know what you want them to mean, but the truth is they sound hollow and empty to me at this point. What, what word could anyone possibly hear that would break through the hardened experience of living in the midst of the consequences of faithlessness and sin. 
What word could possibly free someone from the prison of prolonged exile and displacement and defeat or decline? In 1943, Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer was in a military prison in Berlin, accused of being part of a plot to assassinate Hitler. Throughout his ministerial career and his childhood growing up at home, before that, Bonhoeffer had loved the season of Advent and Christmas. And in 1943, from his prison cell, he wrote to his family and to his friends about his memories and and hopes for the Advent season as he sat in his prison cell. He, he wrote about happy memories of Advent he had shared with them. He wrote about giving and getting gifts amongst the family. He, he wrote about the music that he enjoyed with them. And he also wrote this from his prison cell that Advent. Life in a prison cell, he wrote, may well be compared to Advent. One waits and hopes and does this or that or the other, things that are of really no consequence. The door is shut and can only be opened from the other side. In prison, Bonhoeffer was beset by longing and homesickness and the torment of separation from those he loved so much. And he wrote, we just simply have to wait and to wait and to wait, there's nothing else for us to do. He also wrote, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those troubled in soul who know themselves to be poor and imperfect and who look forward to something greater to come. What's the waiting that you face today? What's the nature of the confinement that you may experience? What's the prison like? Or what feels like a prison to you? The waiting of not knowing when or if or how the consequences and damage from a mistake that you have made or from a personal failure or from some sin, how will that or can it possibly ever be lifted from your life? Or is it the waiting of of circumstances and events that seem beyond your control to simply unfold before you? What will the doctor's report say? What will the operation find out? Or is it waiting for a new way of life to open up for you after some abrupt change that you've experienced for a new pathway to, to be opened for you when you didn't think there was any way forward we faced only a sense of darkness. Where do you find yourself waiting? Where do you find yourself confined? Where do you find yourself hoping against hope that there will be a word which can only come from the outside? If that's at all where you are, near to where you are, or even perhaps to someone you know and love, the words of Isaiah from chapter 40, which begin a whole new movement within the prophetic voice, a movement now spoken to the people who are going to find themselves on the verge of return from exile, yet still in confinement, still scattered, but now on the verge of God breaking in the world to do something new, to bring them again together to the place where he wants them to be. The word is comfort. The passage opens uh, like a decision that has been made in the heavenly councils of God speaking to angels and beings, giving them a command, giving them instruction. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell them that their warfare has ended, that they have served double for all their term. Comfort, comfort, My people, the command goes forth. And then those angels, those beings, carry the command to another. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then a voice answers out in objection and protest, like we might want to say ourselves, what can I cry out? All people are like grass. All flesh it withers and fades. 
And then the response comes to us in the midst of our hesitation, in the midst of our disbelief and our objection. All people are like grass. The flower withers and fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion. Declare, fear not. Good tidings, good news. Behold your God. This is the the new move in the life of the people of God, in the life of a people of God who always said, no, you can never see God. No, you can never be before God without falling under God's wrath, without reclining and, and being cast down by God's power. Now the prophet is giving charge to those to go forward and say, don't fear. Behold, here, here is your God. But where? Where do you say? And who shall speak that word? One of my favorite movies, besides Shawshank Redemption, which I talked about at the beginning, is another movie that came out about 15 years ago called Millions. It's a British film. The director was well-known, Danny Boyle. And it's the story of a family of two little boys, two brothers, Damien and Anthony and their father, Their mother has recently died, and they're struggling at odds with each other to begin to try and find some semblance of life together. The movie happens and takes place a few weeks before Christmas time. Little Damien, who's probably 9, 10, or 11 years old, goes out into the woods behind his house regularly into a cardboard fort there to just be alone and imagine And one of the things that he imagines throughout the movie is the appearance of different Christian saints throughout history who come to him and and talk to him. He's become fascinated by these visions. And these saints come to him at different points in his little journey to try and help him along. Joseph comes and and helps him while he's taking part in the the school's nativity play. Peter comes into his bedroom and talks to him about locks and keys and how to keep things safe. Other saints come to him describing. And the reason he's so fascinated about the idea of saints is because, because he wants to know for sure about his mother and, and where she is. He wants some kind of confirmation that she's okay, that she's in heaven. And he's concerned she may not be there because, because did she do something wonderful? Did she do a miracle like the saints had to do to get into heaven and to be highly regarded? Damien had also found a giant suitcase of money, money that had been cast off by burglars who had committed a big bank heist out into the countryside behind their house, behind his house as the train went by. He discovered this money, and part of the rest of the movie is, is, is Damien and his brother Anthony and then his dad and others trying to figure out ways to spend that money as fast as they can because they're on the verge of of the British pound sterlings going to the European Union dollars and that money would be worthless. Millions of pounds if they didn't spend it quickly enough. Damien wants to give away as much as he can to the poor, but all the others want to just spend it on themselves, (laughs) buying presents, having parties, doing all kinds of lavish things. And so there's this tension between Damien and his family and what they're going to do with this money. And finally, towards the end of the movie, Damien is just beset by his failure to be able to do enough good and to be able to get his family to do good as well that he goes out into the backyard again and he takes what little money he had left over, he dumps it on railroad tracks and sets it on fire, a bonfire. And then suddenly a train goes by and scatters the money everywhere. And then when he looks up, his mother's there. He's having a vision of his mother and they have this conversation. She says to him, the money just makes everything worse, doesn't it? Damien starts to say something, and then she says, don't interrupt, I'm dead, I know what I'm talking about. (laughs) And she says to him, you need to use conditioner on your hair. Your dad won't think about that, but it makes all the difference. She says, you're not to worry about me. You have been worried about me, haven't you? And she says to him, I'm fine. And he says to her, dad doesn't believe any of it. Dad doesn't believe anything. And she says, Dad can't see me. And he asked, is it because of the money? And she says, in a way, 
The money makes it harder to see what's what, but you know that already. You know how complicated the money was? Well, people are even more complicated. You re- need to remember, Damien, that there will always be enough good around to keep on going forward no matter what. You just have to have a little faith, Damien. You know, if you've got faith in other people, that makes them stronger. And Damien, I'm here to tell you, you've got enough faith to sort all three of you out. That's why I'm counting on you, she says to him. And he says, I haven't really been worried about you. I've just been missing you. And she says to him, well, that's allowed. And he asks her, are you really a saint? And she says, well, the criteria is very strict. It's not just a case of doing good and all that. You have to do an actual miracle. And then he ponders, and and she can see he's questioning. and, And she says to him, but I'm in. Of course I am. And he asked, what was your miracle? And she says, don't you know? It was you. It was you. The word that Advent prepares us to hear as we prepare for the birth of Christ, the word that Advent calls us to see as we look For the light of Christ coming into the world, the word is, you are the work of God's love, grace, and goodness. You. You are the one to whom the words are spoken. You are the one for whom the words are meant, comfort, tenderness, a new way being made, For God to come into your life, good news, glad tidings, don't be afraid. Here is your God, shepherd, who will lead you, carry you in his arms, and gently guide you. Here is your word, the word of a new vision in the birth of Christ for the story of our lives and our futures. You're the one, you're the work of God's love and forgiveness and goodness. We hear that in the manger and we'll see that on the cross. And the spirit may bring it to power in our hearts so that we can share it with others, you. You're the work of God's love and goodness and grace. Let it be so. Amen.